Hey, it's Chelsea. The audio for like the first 50 seconds of this episode is kind of weird, but then it gets normal after that. So yeah, enjoy the show. What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. If I ever find a little bass, it's a business. A dead meat. Welcome! Dead Me Podcast, your horror saved me, but I'm Chelsea. And I'm James, and we're married, and we're like to get scared again. Yeah. Oh, I can't believe like so. Oh, yeah. Cool. Thank you, Scotty. <laughs> <laughs> And it's so funny because normally we've got Gressel over doing our live producing and switching, but now it's just kind of like a gaping black maw where I can kind of see people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I see like three or four rows back and then it's just blackness. And yeah. I'm like, all right, hope everyone's smiling back there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. The Crow. Who, who had watched this for the first time for, for this, this show? Episode, Lots yeah. of you. Okay. Yeah. Now, and we can be honest, uh, you know, those of you who hadn't seen it, for a lot of you, was the only thing you knew about this movie the fact that the lead actor, unfortunately, was killed during production. I think that is often the first association people have with this movie, and that's what, a shame. I have a question. Who just found that out right now? Okay, hi. Wow. I'm going to give you a minute to, like... Yeah, you know that awesome performance? Yeah, that guy that's, died that's doing it. That's kind of it. It. it sucks. Unfortunately. Yeah. It's, it's really unfortunate. I didn't even think about that. I just take that for granted that people know that. Yeah. Yeah, take a second. Um, if, if you just watched The Crow and didn't do any like research or, or read anything about it, you might not have known that. They, I, just, I just realized that right they now. They do a very very good job working around the fact that that happened. It happened later in production. I think they had like nine days left of shooting. Yeah, they had yeah. shot all of the, the primary like action stuff and I think they were just going to go back and shoot some flashbacks and some of the stuff with his fiance while they were living and happy and then uh, unfortunately this, this horrible accident happened and so they had to shoot around it and that's why a lot of the, the flashbacks are very He's um, silhouetted and we're using um, a lot of the other Characters' side stories get fleshed out in interesting ways. Um, yeah, Albrecht and the uh, little skater girl. Yeah, the, I don't de think... the detective. Yes, yeah, Detective uh, Albrecht. Ernie Hudson. At, Ernie Hudson. They did not have as prominent of parts originally. Right. And then they had to go back and be like, oh, we need to fill some of this time. So yeah. that's why they, they filmed all those extra scenes with them, which if, if you felt like those were like, oh, I thought we were watching The Crow, that's why those were there. Right. Was because Brandon Lee, unfortunately, was killed. And it was... It was while shooting an early scene. Yeah, it, it, it comes early in the movie. It is the uh, kind of inciting incident, the like origin story of, I'm, I was going to say the crow, but actually he's technically not the crow. It's like a Frankenstein's monster kind of thing. Oh, you're right. The crow is, is, is the crow. crow. Yes. Yeah, there's, a, the, there's an actual crow, uh, which is actually a raven. It's a raven because ravens are bigger and smarter than, than crows. They're easier to train. They use like four, four or five ravens, of yeah. them. Yeah, there's some interesting stories about those birds they had to use on set, but yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, we, we should do our, our normal spoiler-free section for anyone listening at home, because we yeah. are recording this, and we will be releasing it to your podcast feeds, and on our new channel, Dead Me Presents, hey. this will be the first <laughs> podcast episode released there, so yes. make sure you're subscribed. The first podcast for the new channel, or I like to call it Dead Me Presents. It's not Dead Me Presents. I think it's Dead Me Presents. Well, that's because every present. video is a gift. It's right. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. <laughs> but yeah, so The Crow, 1994, but it was based on a graphic novel uh, written over the 80s. It yes, took him like... it was written throughout the 80s by James O'Barr. And it's such an interesting story because it was never meant to be a, uh, like, successful, quote-unquote. Like, this was not meant to, like, sell well. This was, like, one man's very personal Project. There's a lot of grief embedded in this story. Um, yeah, sorry we picked a downer. We did kind of pick a, a bummer a episode. For a live show. But here's the thing: is like you know all the stuff surrounding this, like the kind of um, weird allure of the fact that like someone, oh, someone died during production. It's it's weird how when I was looking, you know, studying this movie, I've watched it so many times at this point. I was doing research. Like that ended up being one of the least interesting things about it to me because. 
like that actor, like Brandon Lee gives so much to this movie and is so, he's such an interesting person. Like everyone really gave so much to this that I think that incident as part of a greater whole, just to me, it, 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 it's just a sad kind of footnote almost. And I think that's the way they wanted this movie to be remembered. I don't think any of them would have wanted it to be, oh, the movie where that happened. It's this project they all really loved. I think that's why they made the decision to go back and finish it. There was yeah. after like, you know, they didn't immediately just continue shooting and, and finish. There was debate over whether or not they should finish this movie. But ultimately, and I believe with Brandon Lee's fiance at the time, yeah. he was engaged at the time she of She was death. like the big driving force behind like, no, you, you, you should all finish it. Yeah, it's like he put so much into it. Let's finish it and have this movie. And obviously it's dedicated to them at the end. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you're, you're right. His death is um, obviously a big part of the history of this movie. But the movie is so much more than that. Mm -hmm. It's especially his performance because I, I hadn't seen this movie growing up. I only watched it. Uh, we, we both watched, watched it for the first, it for time, the first a time a few years ago. Yeah. And it was one of those big blind spots. Like you'll see the crow on all those, like a picture of all the horror icons in a movie theater watching like crows back there, stand T posing, you know, he's always <laughs> amongst the other icons included in those panoramas. And so it was always a blind spot. And I, I don't know, it never really appealed to me. It felt like it would be more of an act. And, and truth be told, it's barely a horror movie. Like This is an interesting thing I did want to talk about is I think that this barely qualifies as a horror movie. And I'm not saying that in, in a bad way. But even watching the, the director's commentary, Alex Preyas, uh, Australian director, he did like Gods of Egypt and some other weird stuff. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> He's got definitely like a style about him. These big kind of like comic booky movies. I'd be surprised if anyone in any behind the scenes stuff ever called it a horror movie. Never. No, never I don't think once he and even he cites his influences and it ranges from like westerns, uh specifically that big kind of shootout in the warehouse. Uh, ah, yes. Top Dollars Warehouse is like a western. It, it's like a western meets John Woo. Uh, he also cited Chinese fantasy films with, like, wire work. They, they wanted to do more wire work but could not afford it. And apparently, I mean, it makes sense. It takes a while to film and choreograph that kind of stunt work. Yeah, but it, it's, it's, I guess, mostly a dark, gothic, action-y film. It's uh, based on a graphic novel, so it's kind of a comic book. I mean, it's kind of a superhero. And, like, yeah, I think the fact that it is such a, like, it's so informed by the goth subculture, particularly, like, the goth subculture of the 80s. Yes. I think that's maybe what kind of puts this in the horror neighborhood and why horror fans have almost adopted it as a horror movie. And, and what surprised me when we watched it for the first time a few years ago was that it wasn't as brooding as I thought it would no, be. No, it's fun. Especially I the character, he's, Eric. Yes, he's fun. And he's, he's funny. And I think he's really charming. He's not, you would expect, you know, just looking at that character, you would expect maybe he's kind of an edgelord a little bit. <laughs> yeah. But he's not at all. I think he's, he's sweet. And I, I especially love the little scene where it's, he realizes or remembers, like, he, he's doing all this on Halloween night. Mm -hmm. Or Dev is it? Because I know it happens on Devil's Night, but I think it's like Devil's Night into Devil's Halloween. Devil's Night, Michigan. Hey. That's a Michigan thing, by the hey. way. I don't know if any of you have lived elsewhere or talked to people not in the state. If you mention Devil's Night elsewhere, people are like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" Yeah. That's a, that's an us thing. That's a Detroit thing. So, but it's that scene where you you see him kind of pause for a second and realize, like, "Oh yeah, it's it's Halloween," because these kids in costumes run by and. He's laughing with them, and they yeah. just think he's some dude in a costume, and it's this really quick moment of, of peace. I love it. And, and that's why his performance is so good, is because it's, it's, uh, it carries the movie and turns it from what could be kind of a slog, just a vengeance slog, into something where you're, you're really enjoying every time he's on screen and, and making these jokes and talking about Jolly Pirate nicknames. Love Jolly Pirate. Jolly Pirate my line. Club with Jolly Pirate nicknames. <laughs> And that's definitely by design, because going back to the, the original graphic novel, uh, it was written in pieces uh, throughout the 80s by James O'Barr, who was inspired to write the story after his fiance was killed by a drunk driver. When and, they were like 18. They were young. They were yeah. like 18 or 19. Yeah, in the late 70s. She was 70s. killed in the late 70s. And so then he wrote this throughout the 80s. So already you're starting off. This thing is just informed by grief, right? And the novel itself is very humorless. It's episodic. It's, it's in kind of a weird order, too, because I think it's, it's really, I mean, you're just reading a guy working through some stuff, and he even said after he was finished with that project, like, I don't even think it helped at all. I think he has said, like, it just was like, 
he did it, thought it would make him feel better, and like, and it, it, it's weird how much that often, that, or like that echoes the uh, kind of often said thing about like a revenge story is like revenge, yeah. like, you know, you it's think gonna it's going to make you feel good, but it doesn't. It feels like a similar kind of thing. And then it took years to get the movie made. It was bouncing back around between studios and writers and producers. And then he finally finds someone who can make it uh, in a collaborative nature with him having input and then they get Brandon Lee and he's fully into it. He transforms his body, loses like 20 pounds to be this uh, person coming back from the dead and then this accident happens and because Brandon Lee is engaged at the time, this poor writer this is just reminded weird, all over. kind of shad, like echo of what, yeah, it's, it's all very eerie and tragic but I do think like making the film and you know James Obar getting to know the people involved I do think maybe that you know filmmaking process in a way was more cathartic for him than like writing the actual story you know when you're working with it's a communal project at least and it sounds like his friendship with Brandon like even though it was so brief was like very significant they grew very close Yes, yeah, they seemed really tight. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, between him and... I know the director made some other movies. One of the writers, there were multiple at various stages, but one of the writers, one of the most prominent writers, also wrote, like, Critters 3 and 4, Hell I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I think he wrote Texas Chainsaw 3. Cool. So, like, not great films, but regardless, all of them have this on their, discogra or on their filmography. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they have this, like... Uh, just cult classic and very good movie, in my opinion, that stands against the test of time. And I think everyone should be happy that they made I mean, it's so influential. Obviously, The Crow had a bearing on uh, Heath Ledger's Joker, very clearly. And I think you call them just opposite uh, poles of morality. Yeah, I, like, the, like uh, Brandon Lee in this, I'm just going to call him The Crow, this whole, or Eric Draven. Uh, and then The Joker are like weird kind of, Polar opposites. They're on like a morality scale. The like painted clown boy <laughs> morality scale. <laughs> and then, and then you, I, I you, you okay, may have. I, I, I don't want to claim to be the first person to have noticed this, but I tried googling this, and Google's extremely broken now. Like it's impossible it's to Google it. <laughs> AI shit. You just get AI articles about everything, but I think that this movie is a very big influence on the room. If yeah. anyone has seen The Room. Yes. I swear, especially the flashbacks in this movie, there are such, yeah, I hear people, re yeah, like, people I hear clicking. the wheels turning. It's clicking for a lot of you. If you've seen The, the Room. The canopy bed. And if you don't know what I'm talking, The Room is an infamously terrible movie. I've seen it so many times. <laughs> um, but the flashbacks in this movie, you've got Eric, his fiance, and they're kind of like, they're like throwing pillows at each yeah, other. Yeah, they're right? having a pillow fight like they do in the room. The walls are the same color. They even have their um, pseudo adopted kid that they take care of and hops yep, in the bed yep. and is. All that's missing is Eric fucking her belly button. Tommy Wiseau, yes, yes. <laughs> We're going to get thrown out of this. And place. Tommy Wiseau, he's got the long hair, he's wearing all black. I swear. And I don't know yeah. if this has ever been point, but I'm, I'm claiming it here. Uh, you heard it here first, maybe. It's, <laughs> yeah, breaking news. <laughs> uh, also, for anyone listening who hasn't watched the movie, if we haven't sold you already, uh, two other things that might get you to go pop that in and watch. Uh, pop that in. Like, no one watches <laughs> physical fucking media. Pull up whatever streaming service you see is on Just Watch that has it currently before they take it down arbitrarily. Uh, <laughs> the soundtrack is fucking great. It is a perfect encapsulation of the early 90s grunge alt-rock scene, which you might be hearing all these bands on the soundtrack and being like, wow, they grabbed they, the I biggest names at the time. I can't believe they got the all these bands. No, they got them right before they became the biggest bands at the time. And it's crazy. It's so cool. Uh, one of the bands cut from this soundtrack because the studio was like, eh, no, they're too, like... They're, They're nothing. Not gonna They're not going to... A white zombie was cut from the soundtrack. One of the songs that was almost in the movie before they decided, no, it's not that big a deal, Creep by Radiohead almost made it in. Uh, the song Silverfuck by Smashing Pumpkins was written for this film and it was cut from the soundtrack because Smashing Pumpkins was like, wait, no, this is 
uh, really good and we want this back. Yeah, they're like, actually, we're going to put this on our own album. We're putting this on Siamese soundtrack. Dream. Sorry, you can have like this other thing. It's like, did Siamese Dreams need to be better? It's so good. That's, my, so that's, good. My, that's my favorite. That's my and movie. the other thing is the cast. It's got so many awesome people besides Brandon Lee. You've got... Michael uh, Wincott in a wig, I yeah, think. It's a very good wig. A, it, we yes. weren't sure. We, we literally had our researcher look because I needed to know if it was a wig or not and confirmed it is some kind of hair piece, but it's really good. It's it's really good. That must be what front lace is that? What's called? Oh, like a lace front. I don't even lace think it's front. a lace. I don't know what's going on there. It's very nice. It's very good. But Michael Wincott, you might know him better now from Nope when he is uh, the cinematographer and uh, he's got that gravelly yeah, voice. He's the guy who talks like this. <laughs> <laughs> very good, hon. <laughs> I wish we had a pitch shifter like we do on streams. Oh, yeah. yeah. Then we could just mess around no, with that for, for an hour and a half. Live show. Uh, Bai Ling is his Bai half Ling. sister and lover. So mm-hmm. unpack that as you will. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Just Hannibal Rising and then this. We're getting into it. Yep. And, uh, <laughs> um, and of course, his number one lackey, Tony Todd. Tony Todd. Hey. As who was supposed to be at Astronomicon, which we was, just came from. But he wasn't because he was getting an award. So. Yes. For his Hell work yeah. in Spider-Man 2, yeah, the video the game. game yeah. mm-hmm. his well voice deserved. Yeah. But it sucks. We wanted to ask him, like, Tony, what's You're a little... You're Tony. Can you, can you give tell us, a little tasty us any tidbit? cool stuff for the live show? Yeah. What, what, what exclusive news can we What was it like being in the Chrome? Do you, do you remember when you were in the Chrome? <laughs> <laughs> well, guess. we got Ernie Hudson looking exactly the same as he does now. <laughs> yeah. Can we? I gotta stop the whole show to talk about the pictures from of him at the Ghostbusters premiere. Does everyone know what I'm talking about? Because he's like all 80. Over to, he looks so good. <laughs> he's ripped and he's like 80. Yeah, we were watching this when we were staying with my mom last week in Tampa. And we were oh, like, yeah, oh, mom, that's Ernie Hudson. She's like, oh, I saw him on my TikTok. Yeah. He is a good looking man. We're like, yep. So he's he's reached the mom he's reached mom talk. Oh, That's yeah. his his far reach. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I definitely think if you haven't seen it, you should. It's a great uh, movie. Very simple structure. That's easy to follow once you understand what's going on. Yeah, and they had to invent plot to make this work as a movie, too. Oh, yeah, we can talk about that. Yeah, we'll I'll, get there. you think it's better than the graphic novel. I mean, it, they're, they're completely different experiences. Like, um, this movie, it's a movie. It's got a, a structure and a narrative, and it feels like more of a cohesive sit down and enjoy this piece than the graphic novel, which feels like almost you shouldn't be reading it because it's so personal. It's and like it's, a notebook you found under someone's bed. Yeah, it's very yeah. stream of consciousness and it's you know it you could feel the the grief and it is be- like the artwork is beautiful and it's cool to see his artwork evolve too because he worked on it for so long oh yeah i didn't think about it that. changes and depending there's like you know the flashback is done in a completely different medium too it's really interesting but it's it's different yeah and you don't get like stunts and <laughs> a, a comic book <laughs> You do get some stunts in the movie. I do, and miniatures. I love me some miniatures. And some what? Miniatures. There's like oh, all kinds yeah, of little those miniatures. There's tiny buildings and cars all over this movie, and I'm very into it. I mean, that's basically how it starts. Is uh, it's on... it's a tiny little city on fire. It's a tiny little Detroit on they fire. They say it's Detroit. Detroit. Does it look like Detroit? Well, no. I see I see an above ground subway rolling by, Dude, so I'm saying no. The, I don't think that's the people mover. The, the like nightmare apocalypse version of Detroit and the Crow has better public transportation than Detroit. <laughs> Or maybe, I don't know, maybe it's supposed to be the people mover. I don't know. <laughs> was the people mover around back then in 94? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah, okay. It probably would have cost like 25 cents. What does it cost now? Does anyone know offhand? It's free? We did it! We did it! <laughs> <laughs> you can go from one part of downtown to a uh, slightly more distant part of downtown. Hell yeah, for dude. For free. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's, it's this miniature city that they're they're panning across and it looks like Gotham. It's a very it's yeah Gotham looking city. It's very city. Gotham. I mean this this whole movie feels like a Batman movie that isn't, if that makes sense. Yeah, even with him looking like the Joker. It's like It's weird, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, and then uh, what? It's like Commissioner Gordon is kinda Yeah, Albrecht Ernie Hudson. is a very Commissioner Gordon where it's like, wait a minute, is that Oh, I think it is that guy, you know? Yeah. And where he disappears when he turns his you know, he looks somewhere else and he's gone. 
And when he, he has his he hat. He cracks a little joke. And <laughs> he's in his underwear with his hat on. Ernie Hudson in his underwear and hat. Oh, on the director's commentary, Alex Proyas is like, I had to convince him to do that because he thought it was so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. But he wore him down. <laughs> and I love it. It's a cute little outfit. I, I hope he. I hope he looks back with fondness. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, and we get we get a reason for why it's called the crow. There's some crow lore. Does this come from anywhere? Or was this wholesale invented for this movie? The idea that a crow carries your soul to the land of the dead. But if uh, if some if some if shit went down, something so terrible happens. Yeah. I can't remember if that lore is specific, like the way that that's laid out is is lifted from the comic book or not. Because the crow can bring your soul back to right some wrongs. The crow is also, like, the animal itself has a lot more, like, uh, personality in the comic book. It's it's talking up a storm, and it's a bit more of, like, a guiding force. What's it saying? Uh, I almost asked what, what it sounded it's, like. You know, it, there, <laughs> there are scenes where, you know, it flashes back to, to the two of them being murdered, and the crow is trying to get him to, like, stop. You oh, know? Well, it's get dark. a look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Gil- was that a Gilbert Gottfried almost? Dude, oh, fucking Iago, <laughs> just flying around, like... No, it's it's more of him, it like... It goes deeper! <laughs> it's top dollar! <laughs> it's almost like his, the other half of his brain. You know, it's it's like the, when you kind of notice you're starting to have an intrusive thought, it's the other part of your brain saying, like, no, don't go down that road kind of thing. Oh, that's interesting, because didn't they cut from the movie uh, a character played by Michael Berryman? They did. Called yeah, the they, Skull? The, yeah, they cut, like, a, a skeleton cowboy character. Yeah. I know. Right? I know. Um, it's so funny how much disdain Alex Proyas, the director, has for this this character because you can tell in the years since this movie has been made, the number one thing like super annoying fans like us ask him at like conventions or whatever is like, why did you cut the skeleton cowboy from the movie? And he's so can we sick see of the it. skeleton, please? please? Why? I think it, yeah. And he's like, it's confusing. It works in the comic book. He's almost, he's another kind of like dream figure, almost like a mentor guiding him through his emotional journey. But they, he just, in the movie, it was just becoming, there's too many layers of weird. And, and then I think they had to film more scenes with him, with Brandon uh, at the time of the accident. So like that happened there, like, well, then we'll just. It, yeah, it just was like too many elements of, of kind of surreal. They, they, they just wanted, they, they streamlined uh, that bit of it. Poor Michael Berryman getting cut from this movie. Yeah. He's been in enough iconic stuff. It's mm-hmm. fine. He's got, he's, he's got credits. He's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're at the crime scene where uh, Eric Draven is on the street dead after having fallen out the window of like, I guess I asked how they could afford this penthouse apartment, but on second thought, it might just be someone's attic. It's like the very top of this building mm-hmm. and uh, it's, it's not the, the nicest it's apartment. It's kind of like an artist loft. Yeah, I guess it's an artist Yeah, love. where he lives with his fiance Shelly at his Devil's Night, and their apartment is broken into by a group of nasty dudes who the fire it up gang. The fire it up gang. That's who we were emulating. I know. We're I realized. A bad yeah. Example. Mm-hmm. That's. Uh, but still fun. Also, also, just because this is in my head, and I can't, I have to say it. Uh, I doubt anyone. I doubt anyone here has listened to as much Cottonmouth Kings as me. But there's a song. <laughs> called Cottonmouth Kings Fire It Up, Fire It Up, Fire It Up. Do and you think that that's a reference? That's my question. I have to get D-Loc on the phone. Email cottonmouthkings at gmail.com. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure if that ever existed, they got way too high and forgot the password <laughs> to ever log into that again. Sure. So. <laughs> anyway, yeah, this gang uh, murders both of them um, in, in the flashback. They what? They, mur- they murder both of them. Yeah, Sorry. they also they they sexual. We're doing some her. we're doing some sexual. It's not good. I mean, at least the movie is not. We're 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 hinting at it. You get the you get the gist of what's going on. Yeah, it's not egregious. No. they're not reveling in it. Yeah, and uh, because this is the scene where when they were filming it, this Brandon is Lee this was is the scene they filmed this towards the end of production, and it was um, actor is it Michael Massey? The guy who played uh, what's his name? Stank. Fun boy. Oh, Fun Boy. Fun Boy, yeah. Stank, Stank is, I heard giggling, that's a character's name. That's a, yeah, they got, it, I like it's, we it's said the, Jolly Pirate crew with Jolly Pirate Nick. Yeah, there's Tintin and Stank and yeah, Fun Boy is, uh, and T-Bird. Fun Boy, played by Michael Massey, is the actor who uh, had the gun that... Yeah, and, and so what happened, I guess we can just get 
get it well, out of the way. I mean, we're all, I'm sure every, you know, that's what everyone's kind of. Yeah, like it, how did it, it happen? It's the weird kind of thing hanging over this whole movie. So, uh, as you may be aware, Chelsea and I are not the foremost experts on firearms. But from my understanding, what happened was they were filming close ups with the gun firing. And for that, they had dummy bullets in there. I'm just going to read from our notes. Okay. What happened that our are researcher... Are these from Bella? Put, these are Bella, yes, our Shout researcher Bella. Shout out to Bella. our researcher, Bella. Listen, it's always... Yes. <laughs> That's all for you, Bella. Oh, well, yeah, it's all for you. But, like, it's just, you know, we don't know a ton about firearms, and when we get stuff wrong, people who do know a lot about firearms get mad, and that's scary sometimes. They get real um, mad. They take it personally. All right. Uh, so forensic tests found a metal-tipped bullet had become lodged in the chamber of the gun used in the scene. The bullet had been modified for a previous sequence in which it rested in the chamber as a dummy cartridge. This meant that the shell was intact, but the gunpowder primer was removed. Effectively, it was a bullet that couldn't fire. The problem was that residue of primer had remained in the rear of the cartridge, which had discharged. The force wasn't enough to project the barrel out or the bullet out of the gun. Instead, it wedged partway into the barrel, and it was still there when blank rounds, which had gunpowder but no bullet, were inserted for the death scene, and the gunpowder went off, and the lodged bullet was discharged. So basically. Like half, you two halves to make it a, was like two halves of two separate things came together to accidentally create a real bullet that fired. Yeah, and, and it hit him in the stomach, and he collapsed. And it, and it was unfortunately a similar thing to what happened on on Rust, Rust where it was um, the Crow was a a, a non union production. Um, at this point in the shoot, I believe most of their effects. Uh, Team. I'm they had filmed everything with the bigger guns, and so the firearm team, the specialists, had left. They yes. were like, we're, we're done so here. They this were assistant down to can like take a care bare of it. bones um, crew. Yeah, and the assistant didn't know about the rule where you have to check the gun before and after always using it. And because it was kind of a rushed, non-union production, they were like, all right, let's, let's get going. Yeah, it was specifically because all of the work involving semi-automatic weapons had been finished earlier. Yeah. The weapons specialists were gone, and the remaining crew, yeah, they just didn't know proper procedures. And yeah. I, it was kind of a similar-ish thing to what happened on Rust, where it was just, yeah, procedures weren't followed correctly. Just, yeah, that, I mean, that's how accidents happen, is when you take shortcuts. And uh, I know that they had talked about the entire filming process for this up to this point being really... You know, slapdash. Uh, brand- it, this whole production sounds miserable, honestly. Yeah, cold as, and as, wet. As much love went into this and as much as everyone did care deeply about this story and project, it sounded like hell to me. I know, we need Chauncey to maybe talk about this movie yeah, on right? a production tales. Oh, she would have a ton to talk about on production Absolutely, tales but it's, it was freezing. They filmed in North Carolina on a back lot. Hey! <laughs> hey, we're in Detroit! Get out of here. <laughs> Quiet. This is Michigan country. <laughs> they no, filmed- if you came here from North Carolina, actually, thank you. It's awesome. <laughs> they filmed on a back lot in North Carolina. It was like a back lot and then that warehouse that was like an old factory where they filmed uh, top dollar scenes. It was just this fridge, like no heat or anything with those giant windows. Yeah, Ernie Hudson was like, can we get a heater for Brandon Lee? Because he's like shirtless and uh, 130 pounds, yeah. I think six foot, 130. He had dropped all this weight. Cause he, he if you didn't know, uh, we didn't mention it. He's Bruce Lee's son. So he was also, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he was also a martial artist who had been in a lot of action movies before this and was super muscular. Yeah, but- he was huge. And it, and it was a thing where when they were casting for this, a lot of people on the production were kind of, Eh, on his casting because I think one, he was just a lot bulkier, but two, all the movies he'd done up to this point were kind of like, you know, cheesy, like kung fu Like starring style, Bruce Lee's like, son. Right. Yeah, yeah. He, he had said that this was the first time he didn't feel like Bruce Lee's son. That's that he was part his own of actor. The, the tragedy. And I think that that is a big reason why his fiance wanted them to finish this is because this whole production, Brandon Lee was saying like this, yes, this is the first movie where I feel like I am, Brandon Lee, not, I'm not Bruce Lee's son. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that's why he, he dropped 20 pounds to look more like he thought the character should look. And, uh, he, but he was doing all this cold, wet shooting with no all his heaters. Own, all his own stunts except for uh, very high falls. Yeah. 
because, I mean, at that point, they were like, we just, we just don't want to risk it. I think that was about, yeah, I know. Yeah, right. <sighs> so, but I think everything else, like, was him. And the director even says, like, if you notice, he moves so fast in this movie. And that's not, like, any in-camera trickery or post-product. Like, he's genuinely oh, just he's... so fast. He, it was interesting. Alex Proyas called, said he, like, moved between the frames, which I thought was a cool way to describe yeah. his physicality in this. It's like yeah. when, you're, when your security cam picks up like a hummingbird, but the frame rate matches yeah, the, the wing sure, speed, and it looks like sure. it's just levitating. Uh, anyway, yeah, it's exactly like that. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they were supposed to get married the next day on Halloween, but now they're, they're dead, uh, The fictional characters. The fictional characters. We can, we can talk about fictional deaths now, because that's more fun. And uh, so uh, Shelly doesn't die right away. She goes to the hospital, and this cop played by Ernie Hudson Albrecht, who, who wasn't promoted because he wasn't a big enough asshole. He's a good cop. <laughs> he's a he's good cop. Cop with a heart of gold. I uh, mean, he's got his, that mustache. I feel like, he, you know, he just looks nice. You know? Cops with mustaches he's got, like, the, I feel like the, like, Gordon, Commissioner Gordon's got that mustache, too. Sure, yeah. You know, like, fictional, friendly cop mustache. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't curl up. It goes, no, it goes down. Oh, no, no, that's no. dangerous. Does, no, no, you can't, you can't twist it. You can't twist it. <laughs> But he, he goes with her to the hospital and stays with her for... For like a day, I think. Yeah, it's He's like 48 the hours or something time, that yeah. takes her uh, to pass away. And uh, then we're a year later. That, that was all just the opening. And a year later, um, uh, Skateboard Sarah, the little adopted kid, who is just like their friend. Yeah, I think she must live really close to them because she her only family is her mother, Darla, who is kind of an absent mother. Yeah, um, so she just hangs out with this... Uh, Eric, who is a, a rock musician, mm -hmm. not like a successful one. Uh, what, what's his band's name? Oh, Hangman's Joke. Yeah, we thought about doing trivia, and that would have been a great trivia That would have been question. really hard trivia. But then we're like, we, we, don't, we have nothing for you. You know what was the other thing we thought? I'm curious if anyone knows this offhand. What's the name of the cat? Does anyone remember? Gabriel! Oh, wow, okay. okay. Damn. Oh, jeez. Okay. I mean, you put a cat on screen, and this audience is going to know it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yes, Sarah is skateboarding around, not Detroit. She's uh, seeing this cop getting hot dog with yes, ketchup okay, and stop, mustard. Stop, 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 stop. Okay, yes. We, we laughed so hard at this because it's like, okay, not only does this not look like Detroit, but the man's eating at a hot dog stand. I don't know. Just a hot dog yeah. with ketchup and mustard. Where's the fucking Coney, Ernie? Where's the Coney? Come on. <laughs> It's bull it's, it takes a little bit of chili and you're 50% more Detroit. Come on. <laughs> the most they can muster is calling them Motor City motherfuckers yeah. at one point, which thank you, I guess. And there's some like dialogue uh, at the beginning about Lake Erie catching on fire. <laughs> they do so that, yeah. That's all they got for us. There's some fun little, little bits of dialogue in this. I'm curious, do we think the new one, and we're, we'll talk about this remake, uh, a little bit. I mean, we have to, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do we think it's going to be set? Or do we, there's do we no way. Do we think they're even going to say a setting? Like, do no, they have they're enough? just any town. Yeah, it could, it took, could place, take place in like the Saw universe. Yeah, like Sawville. Just Cityton. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, man. Yeah, I mean, I, that, I don't know about that movie having like a stylistic viewpoint enough to set it. We'll talk more about it later, I Chelsea's think. Chelsea's mad about it. You know what? I am a little mad about it. And like, I'm, okay, sure, I guess we'll talk about it now okay. then while we're talking, while I'm don't all, you, all fired up Don't you like Bill? Bill? I do, no, I love Bill. Are you kidding me? Bill Skarsgård's so cool. He was, he was Pennywise. He's Pennywise. He was in Barbarian. I love him. I really like uh, FKA Twigs. She's super cool. Wait, what'd you say? On Twitch? FKA Twigs. Oh, oh, I thought you said Twitch. I thought Bill streams? Dude, that's... <laughs> That'd be cool. Yeah, sure. I'll go give him some bits. Some bits. <laughs> 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 Which I still don't fully understand. I just, you know, and I guess we've, we've talked enough about the, the specific things that maybe make me think a remake of, of this specifically is very strange. And I'm typically pretty whatever on remakes. Some are really cool. I mean, you think of the heyday of horror, like what, what so many horror fans consider like a golden age of horror is the 80s. The 80s, you have so many remakes that are now classics. The Fly, The Blob, those are both remakes. The Thing is a remake. You know? 
kind of, yeah. yeah. I mean, it is. It's there. At least it's, it's a, a re, different adaptation. It's a different adaptation. I know. There's, there's. It's a weird gray area, but, but still, still it's, it's still the same guy. You know, I, I think, uh, like Invisible Man, amazing remake. Yeah. I think you know when you do something really different and interesting with your source material, why not? Um, it's as old as film itself. We've always been remaking. We have a whole podcast on we it. Do have a, we have a podcast episode about remakes. Um, but this one, I think because the source material is so like tied to this man's story and then the movie itself, because of what happened, becomes so like linked to that original. Like they're just such... I don't know. It, it's a weird thing, I think. Um, and I, I know that people have been giving uh, Alex Proyas some some shit for being upset about the remake. But oh yeah, because he's publicly he's publicly very upset about this remake. The and director of this of, of so, yeah. yeah the ninety four Crow and like I kind of understand you know because I can't imagine what this would have been like. Sure. I think I don't even know if he came back to set at first for these reshoots of the rest of the movie. Like, it took him a while, and oh, yeah. um, you can tell even the director's commentary, he, you know, I think he puts off talking about it for as long as he can until, like, you have to address it at least yeah. at some point, you know, talking about the... Like, you, you can hear it in his voice, and it's just such a uniquely awful situation that I can't imagine what that would have been like and how strange it must feel to then have... That's str- I don't know I I get it yeah and the other thing too is the the place and the the time that this story is really tied to the music it's like part of this like eighties goth culture and the nineties kind of goth revival too you've got even in the graphic novel you've got lyrics from Joy Division and The Cure written in the pages and that's part of the dialogue and I just I'm I'm so curious how a, a remake it, like, is it, you know, choosing a specific subculture, I hope musical? It does. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you also said, just based on the trailer, because that's all we have right now, that uh, uh, Bill Skarsgård in his makeup looks really out of place in his setting yes, in, it, in this remake, whereas Brandon Lee walking around, it matches the very heightened reality yeah. of this Brandon version Lee of the looks like he is truly a, like a ghost haunting this city. He looks like he's part of the buildings walking around because he, he's, you know, the same kind of color scheme and he, he, he really is like this presence whereas uh, the crow and the remake it just kind of looks like a guy walking around. I don't know, because the, the back, you know, it's the, the color scheme. It's very um, clean, and it's, it's kind of light, and every, like, the building interiors even are very, um, it's like, a, it's on the lighter side, like, all the colors and stuff. I'm just, it's, it's strange. You're, you're very skeptical. I am a little, I'm surprisingly, I'm a little more open-minded I mean, about it. I, I think it might it. be okay. I don't know. The other thing, and once you notice it, you'll you'll never unsee it. Go back and watch that trailer, and this is something that I... what I had this pointed out to me, and it really bothers me. The trailer, every single shot in that trailer is framed with the action in the middle of the frame, um, and I think it's because they intend for people to be able to crop it for TikTok. For vertical... Because people is, is FKA Twigs butt in the middle of? The I frame. think her butt is like that was a lot. I asked for a trailer. It was, I was like, yeah. Jeez, okay. I'm all for showing as much booty as you can get away <laughs> with in a trailer. That's yeah, why they, they call. That's why they call it a teaser trailer. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, I changed my. You know, it's a good remake. We got you know, her butt's really nice. I'm excited to see it. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll see. If nothing else, the movie's got that going for it. There you yeah. go. There you go. We'll see how... But it did have its release date just pushed, like, it last did. week. I think it was supposed to come out real soon. It was coming out, yeah, like... And then it got pushed to August, which I don't know why, but uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe the release schedule was filled up by that studio. I don't even know who's doing it, but, you know, maybe they were just like, it's crowded. Let's move it over here. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we'll, we'll see it. Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll let you know. <laughs> Maybe we'll do a podcast on it. Probably. <laughs> we'll come back here and do it in this very room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Card subject to change. Uh, so, the, the crow lands on... God, we uh, we got to talk about this movie. Yeah. Uh, 
The crow like, I mean, this is, this is yeah, a little peek behind the curtain of every single podcast recording. Yeah, oh, shit. Just yeah. Gressel being like, guys, please, I want to yeah, go uh, eat dinner with my wife. Uh, and we're hey, like, guys, I have 15 minutes left on this hard drive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pick it up. <laughs> uh, Eric comes back to life a year later after the, uh, the raven, no, the crow, played by a raven, uh, lands on his, <laughs> his gravestone and just tap, tap, taps him awake. He's like, hey, wake up. I like that he is named Eric after Eric from Phantom of the Opera. Eric. And Shelley is named after Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. And I and think that that's super His name cute. is Eric Draven, Eric, like Eric DeRaven. Eric, Eric DeRaven. Yeah. And uh, he gets out of his grave, and then I swear to God, this crow is like a little, a little video game critter. It's like, follow the crow to your shoes. And he's like, oh, thanks. And he puts them on. He's like, yeah, follow the sure. crow to this ladder. And he's like, oh, I guess I'll climb this. And the crow's just leading him around like, to all the checkpoints. Like, instead of the infamous, like, video game yellow paint where you paint the ladders, like, you can go this way. It's <laughs> yeah, the crow exactly. showing you. It's like glowing, highlighted, for sure. Yeah, uh, apparently these, <laughs> these ravens, they... They had to train them to fly and weather this cold and wet yeah. because apparently um, all the shots of the, the crow flying over the little miniature sets, it's, it's a green screened crow. So they had to train uh, these ravens to fly in front of a green screen in a giant wind turbine. <laughs> Oh. So they're just like oh. levitating and like place. the wind is pushing them, yes. so they're staying in so place. So they're just literally like, <laughs> and they realized when they were doing that, like, oh god, this bird isn't gonna flap its wings because it has no reason to. It's, it's just, just gonna floating. glide. It's like, oh sweet. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> yeah, it's and then as soon as it starts raining on the bird too, that's gonna change like the the physics of what's you know like the weight on its wings. It was the whole. Yo, this movie changed bird physics. It did change bird physics. <laughs> But yeah, That's it was dope. That's lots dope of behind right the scenes. Um, I was going to say drama. No, they actually sounded like they were extremely cooperative animals to work with. It was just a lot of figuring out, you know, how are we going to wrangle these birds? <laughs> and then they had to train one to be his little, specifically his little like shoulder Oh yeah, friend. shoulder perch. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. Little jolly pirate bird. Yeah, yo. <laughs> that line just really stuck in our cross. I, I like, like it. It's because <laughs> he says it so like. The delivery. Yeah, his is delivery is very funny. But yeah, the, the bird leads him back to his old apartment, which is all trashed because of the crime scene from a year ago. I guess no one bothered to fix it up or sell it. Well, I guess everyone was getting evicted. That's a plot point later. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, but his cat is still there. Gabriel. Surviving. Gabriel. I don't know how, but mice, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but he like pets his cat and then it, it gives him PTSD. This sucks. Uh, well, because what happens is he, and this is, I think, an invented power for this movie, is if he touches someone, he can absorb their memories, and he can, like, experience... So the cat saw it all go down. Right. Oh. Right. I wonder if the cat's okay. <laughs> okay. But it, it shows him what happened, all right. the, the death and the, the assault that happened. Right. Uh, he's sad about that, so he jumps out a window and swings around. Yeah, he's doing all kinds of gymnastics. And yeah. then he's kind of experimenting with it. We get a little, like a little Spider-Man-esque scene where he's running across these rooftops. And well, it's because when he, when he does, uh, he like jumps out the, the window to do the acrobatics on broken glass and then he looks at his hands and his hands heal right away. So yeah. he's like, oh, cool. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, then he's, he's like doing the Matrix, jumping from rooftop to rooftop. Mm -hmm. He's like believing him. Isn't that it? You just got believe or something mm -hmm. in yourself? Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> and then he, he runs into was it Tintin is his first kind of a uh, not boss like mini boss fight <laughs> on his revenge quest yeah um, Tintin is one of the four guys who did the assault and so he like sees him walking around in an alley and he he Jeff Hardy swanton bombs off this <laughs> roof man he full on like Arms behind his back, just falling down. It's pretty good. I feel so, this actor, and I, I realize my, my phone is over there. Uh, Lawrence, um, the actor who plays Tintin, yeah. uh, apparently horribly afraid of drowning and water, and this whole scene is just giant puddles. And they had to, he had to like train to get over his fear. Because of, of puddles? You can drown in a puddle. Yeah, if you're like blackout drunk, he's on a... <laughs> But no, he, he like had to, it was like an extra difficult shoot because it was like this mental block he had to get over. I'm, I'm sorry, because I, I just covered Hannibal Rising where a guy is drowned in a tank and he was afraid of drowning. Yeah. But he had to be in a straight jacket in a tank where he was submerged with the, the doors closing over it. That one I get. 
Well, I do, if I'm remembering correctly We're talking from... about puddles. I'm, if I'm remembering correctly from the, the uh, director's commentary, I do think they may have uh, rewritten some of the... Because I, I think there was it where he was maybe like, you know, held down. Oh, and, uh, yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. That makes more sense. If I'm remembering Because I was like, correctly. where do you live, dude? I hope L.A. Because like, <laughs> not Seattle. <laughs> Just puddles. <laughs> Tintin's only weakness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you like look, if you go to like the Crow uh, game wiki, that's like you can like cheese this fight by uh, yeah. <laughs> holding him in a puddle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he does kill Tintin, though. Yes. Yes. R.I.P. Tintin. Yeah, and he's he's killing everyone in the ways that they acted in the attack. So right. when he walked in and they were attacking his uh, his fiance, Tintin like threw a knife at him. Right. So here, like Tintin's throwing knives and he's catching them, and he ends up stabbing the hell out of Tintin. I think Albrecht says uh, he stabbed him in seven organs alphabetically, something like cool. that. Cool. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. cool. <laughs> oh, also while he's running on the rooftops. I mean, I just gotta mention these these bands. Nine Inch Nails is playing while he's running on rooftops. When he's putting his makeup on. That's the cure, and I guess that was the first time that they ever wrote a song was, just for a movie. Yeah, some more. Yeah, Robert Smith. That was the first time he ever wrote a song for a movie, because um, he uh, was approached to work on this soundtrack, and I think after reading the graphic novel, he was like, "Okay, yeah, I'm gonna write a song for this." That, and then um, Trent Reznor, after he agreed to work on this soundtrack, that finally was like okay, we can add some more obscure artists to this. Like, I think he, Trent Reznor gave this a little bit more legitimacy. He gave it legitimacy. a, a boost. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure. Because, exactly. the, yeah, the record label was like, oh, oh, you got him? All right, cool, we're good. Right. And, and I'll, I'll just note that the composer for the, um, the score itself was Grem Ravel, who I don't know if I'm saying his name correctly, but he's done a lot of work in the horror space. Most notably for me is Child's Play 2, which kind of has the Child's Play music uh, that they use, like, with the title card for the, the series, uh, that was Graham Ravel's orchestration that they kind of reworked for that. So good work on his part in the early 90s. Really killing it then. Uh, yeah, we're, we're at a, a goth, goth club that you can only get in the early 90s, man. This is like Hellraiser 3. I was going to say, there's like Hellraiser 3 for sure. For there's sure. like cages that are cubes and people are in them, suspended from the ceiling. Mm-hmm. And this is where um, Skateboard Sarah's mom is. Darla. Yes, Darla, who she, is with Fun Boy. Oh, yeah. She's having fun with Fun Boy. Yeah, apparently they uh, offered this role to uh, Detroit's own Iggy Pop. He's Detroit, right? Oh, Iggy Pop? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, he's modeled after Iggy Pop. He's like oh, the, fun the boy long is? hair, long blonde hair. And I mean, you look at the graphic novel, like drawing just looks exactly like him. Yeah. Uh, but a uh, budget. No, oh, yeah. Get Iggy Pop. Maybe can't afford Iggy Pop back then. <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, so uh, Brandon is, or Brandon, I'm sorry, Eric is doing his own like research, tracking down these other hooligans, and he goes to this pawn shop that Tintin was at, where we get a great character actor who uh, tries to shoot him, and he's just healing himself, and so he just keeps saying, and I've never heard this expletive used quite like this. Mm-hmm. Shit on me! Shit on me! Shit on me! He's just screaming it. And uh, it's like, if that's what you're into, dude, but uh, he's, he's just a great like little character, just like surly, kind of cor- corrupt pawn shop owner. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's implied that all of the, the rings and most of the other stuff in this shop, he's got kind of a deal with Tom Dollars, guys, where they're going out and killing the people that they kill on their jobs they're sent out on. They're bringing back their stuff, and they've got kind of a... Oh, they're okay. in cahoots with that. Yeah, that's why Eric is such a dick to this, this working man. <laughs> this <laughs> Eric- small business owner. <laughs> And Eric gets um, the, his engagement ring back from him. Right. And you're right. But he, he's kind of a dick, but he doesn't kill him. He lets him live. Uh, he I does, mean, he does explode the shop. Sure. <laughs> but, you know, he you work with Top Dollar, you lose the privilege to run a pawn shop. You know, <laughs> maybe go find a new line of work. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really cool. He, like, loads all the, the stolen jewelry into a this shotgun. Is, this is a cool thing. So the, when he fires the, the rings out of the gun, there's, you, can, you can see the cut if you look for it. But apparently they did some, like, very cool, like, old-fashioned, you know, like, effects trickery for this. It's a bunch of, like, giant metal rings in a tube that... Like a, what, like a, peep, like a potato cannon? Yeah, that they, like dumped out to like they had the camera pointing up and they dumped these giant rings out of this tube towards the camera through like a puff of smoke oh cool and so it's edited 
Divided between the shot and it hitting him. And so it looks like your, your brain just thinks it's, they're tiny. Oh, that's great. And coming out really fast. It's, it's neat. And yeah, that, that blows the place up. And I think it like catches his leg on fire or something, the pawn shop owner. Yeah. And he's like putting out Gideon, I believe his name is, that character. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because Timmy, when he went to go, he was like, take anything you want. And he's like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, and that's when he gives the, the best line of the movie. The because uh, he, he he's asking for their names and he's like Tintin and Fun Boy. He's like, oh, a whole jolly club with yeah. jolly pirate nicknames. I just, we just I just love it so much. It's great. Um, but Albrecht finds Eric after that and is questioning him uh, for the the arson and uh, incineration of this pawn shop. And I like how Eric's just sitting there and like Albrecht's like distracted by these looters. It's so funny because Albrecht is talking to this like possibly undead clown man and he has to decide is this my priority or is the guy looting a tv from this burning store what's more and apparently the the looter is james obar the writer of the the graphic novel in a small cameo taking a tv out of the store (laughs) (laughs) and uh god damn it he just wants to have all the all the crime and so he gets distracted by the looter and eric disappears Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm (laughs) <laughs> is this around when we meet Tom Dollar and his girlfriend sister? Uh, yeah, right after Albrecht <laughs> calls uh, That's Eric. Where they are. <laughs> right after Albrecht calls Eric a uh, mime from hell. Yes, mime from hell. Yeah. Oh yes, yes. This is so we meet Top Dollar, who is the the big bad, played by Michael Wincott, and his what'd you call her? Girlfriend sister. <laughs> That's half what she sis- is. Okay, the half sister. He would correct girlfriend, me. Girlfriend, half sister. That may- and it's not even. It's not even. It's not even girlfriend stepsister. It's half sister. They're still related by blood. You know, there's no getting around this one with uh, loopholes. <laughs> I like how that's the thing we're we're hung up on, and not the fact that their thing is they um, gouge out people's eyeballs and and burn them together. I mean, that's just a regular. I mean, night. that's just. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, she's played by Bai Ling. Yeah. Who, uh, what else is she in? She's like a big, she's got a lot of credits. Yeah, I mean, like I don't have. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, welcome fine. to behind the scenes of the Dead Meat <laughs> Podcast. Like, uh, Gressel just like checks his phone for, for sports scores while we're going things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just assuming sports ball scores. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yes, there he says, one of my crew got himself perished. We're obsessed with this line because uh, Michael Wincott, 1994, being TikTok friendly uh, yeah. in his language. <laughs> He's not saying kill or murder. We got to say instead of unalived or whatever the hell else yeah. we're saying, yeah, we got, got himself perished. <laughs> yeah. Is cool. <laughs> One of our crew was unalived by a clown. <laughs> Good job, man. You might not get age restricted by you too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, uh. <laughs> I love, by the way, because this, this this like fixation on eyes and like the crow too, as as like the kind of device. Um, I think like crows in mythology. Oh yeah, are, and he has like crow vision, right? Yeah, like see. Has, I think he can. see Eric through can the like crow. see through the eye. He can almost like warg into the crow a yeah. little bit. Um, he's, yeah, crow vision. Um. But crows throughout mythology are known to be bringers of prophecy. They have these kind of powers of sight, which is a neat thing. And I think that's why these other characters are obsessed with eyes and they become obsessed with the bird itself and they want to steal the bird to steal its power. But there was some kind of subplot that Brandon Lee helped get cut. Yes, apparently a lot of these stuff with Bai Ling wanting to um, have the bird for herself was cut because Brandon Lee, uh, who is he's half Asian, right? He was very like, you know, he helped consult with the, the screenwriters into, you know, like, hey, uh, maybe he didn't use the word, I don't know if we were using problematic in the 90s, but he worked with them to kind of tone that storyline down. And it's make like a it lot of this is really stereotypical. It was a lot of like, that's, like that's oriental cut. mysticism kind of. Yeah. And he, yeah, he was like kind of, so I, I, I'm, I'm curious what the details were that got cut that made it uh, so that he didn't want it in yeah. there. But because she sure. still wants the bird, right? But it seems more of like just a you know a standard power. I grab. have to wonder if the stuff that was cut maybe was a bit more of like oh the magic of, of it, you know, getting into like the weird, you know, what she would do with it and it being kind of like a yeah. Okay. But I kind of like the way the way it is. It's a bit more ambiguous what she would want to do with it, and I think that makes it 
creepier. I mean, it's probably just, just like gouging its eyes out and burning yeah. them in her little cup. It's like magic goblet that they have. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if we get the full story here, but we do eventually learn that uh, the whole reason that they attacked his fiance in the first place was because she was fighting tenant eviction. Yeah, they were, uh, both her and Eric were, were fighting uh, on, for tenants' rights in their building, and um, that's why Top Dollar kind of sent in his wrecking crew. This is also a film addition uh, to kind of give this a bit of, you know, a bit more motivation. Um, I um, like it. I, I like it too. Um, it is interesting the difference between that and the original story where it's just the original novel, it's it's Eric and Shelly, their car breaks down on the side of the road and it's like a wrong place, wrong time kind of thing. These guys pull up. Uh, random act of violence. It's a totally random thing, which I think does, you know, thinking about what the author himself went through where he lost his fiance in a totally random, like drunk driving. I think that does reflect the kind of, the randomness of that tragedy, but I, you know, in terms of we have to have a plot for a, a film, it, I think that change totally makes sense. And so. it makes her character more interesting because obviously, you know, you don't really it, get a lot it of It does. Her. That's one of the things that, that Alex Proyas consistently says uh, he's very unhappy with, with this movie is he wishes that they had more time to flesh out Shelley. Because right now, it's she is the fiance who gets raped and murdered, and it's the motivation. And you get for these it. kind of like magical flashbacks where she's she's just beautiful, and and you don't get much of her. And 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 the filmmakers would agree, like yeah, you there's not a, a ton of her as a character. But and we yes, might have had more because I think that's what they were going to film. They were going to film more, yeah. Um, yeah. and they I think they did improv a lot of stuff with the two of them. He let them kind of improv as a couple didn't end up using a lot of it he just he he said he like just was never happy with what they did they tried a few different things and none of it really worked quite right but you're totally right that change in terms of the villain's motivation does in turn really color her character and you realize like oh she's you know not only this kind of almost angelic figure we do see her at the end and she's you know she's an all white she is this like totally pure like idealized woman she, you, you do get the sense of who she is as a person and her ideals and why Eric loves her beyond just she seems very nice and pretty yeah she was fighting for something yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. which is you know what he's doing exactly because uh yeah now he finds fun boy who's having a fun time with Darla, uh, skateboard Sarah's mom, and uh, he, he kills Fun Boy. Yeah, and it's so... <laughs> That's the structure of this movie. Yes, it, he I finds mean, it's him the and structure, him. yeah. He finds him, he kills him. Um, but he doesn't kill Darla. Darla is the, the mother of his... Uh, child friend. His child friend. <laughs> exactly. He, like, does this crazy thing where he... Um, She's like a drug addict. His powers are totally, I, I can't really define them, and I don't <laughs> think the movie cares to define them e either. He's able to, like, reverse. It's like Nightmare 3. It's like Dream Warriors, the, like, the uh, heroin coming out of her arms. You know what I'm talking about? Those were veins in Nightmare well, 3 her that he used as little... Oh, oh. Does everyone know what I'm talking <laughs> about? No, that was, Freddie did that so he could put more drugs in her. I know, he, but it's the opposite. <laughs> it's the opposite. But, <laughs> no, here he's, he's like squeezing, squeezing They're them out. They're just weird little holes. That's all I, that's the similarity I was thinking of. Like weird little special effect holes. Yes. The whole, <laughs> you're right, hon. <laughs> but yeah, he's like squeezing the morphine out of her, her holes. Yeah. Her special <laughs> effect holes. Stop saying These holes. holes in your arms, Stop in your veins. But he's, yeah, I mean, he's, because he knows that that's, um, uh, oh my gosh, uh, what, Sarah's. Skateboard Sarah. Sarah's, yeah. yeah. So he knows that that's Sarah's mother, and he tells her, he basically gives her like a pep wake up talk, call. A wake up call is more like it, right? And I think that this, this subplot is a big reason why people are very drawn to this movie, and I think why this movie is very important for people, especially people who saw this maybe when they were a bit younger. Because, like, you know, if you grow up in a less-than-perfect home, like, Eric is, like, the ultimate fantasy guardian figure. He's fixing your mom. He's, <laughs> ma he's, he's, he's making her go home and cook breakfast for you. Yeah. And, I, and I love that scene where Sarah wakes I up, or she comes, in, she comes home and her, her mom is uh, cooking breakfast, and she's like, oh, I forget, do you like him... Um, 
Sunnyside Hopper. And the whole movie, Sarah doesn't call her mom. She, she calls, calls her Darla. Darla. She's right. like, since when do you cook, Darla? And then, and then her mom is like, for a moment, she's like, you're right, I was never cut out for this. And she's real sad. And then Sarah's like, it instantly changes. She's like, I like him sunny side up. Mom. Oh, it's no, like, oh like, man, it's, it's it like, it's so, so obvious it and cheesy, like, but I fucking love it. Yeah, it, it's so sweet. And like the, the performances, I think, really sell this too. And like, it could be so maudlin done by anyone else, but I think these two actors really sell it and I believe it. Yeah. And we were watching this with your mom and I could just feel her like, She's oh. fucking crying, dude. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> It's sweet. It's a really nice scene. And I, I wonder, too, if, if maybe that scene, because um, I know a lot of stuff with Sarah was added after the incident with Brandon, you know, Sarah and, and Albrecht. Um, yeah. And I, I think they were really lucky to have this specific child actor. She's so good in this. Yeah, didn't the actors talk about how uh, when they were talking to her about the role, they were just being like, can you skateboard? Are you scared of stuff like this? And she was like, no, but what about the character's motivation? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It was like, what, 13-year-old actor or something yeah. like that? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he visits Albrecht. This is when he's in his boxers with his hat on. I love, I love getting to see Albrecht's apartment because it looks so different than everything else in this movie. Yeah, it looks less, uh, I don't know, hellscape-y. It's, it's it looks like, standard it's divorce sad. It's very clean, and everything in it's very mid-century. Like, all the furniture and, like, the clock on the wall is that kind of... You think of, like, that... 50s or 60s, so where it's got like the the points and like the little points have the balls on the end, where it's kind of like a like diner style oh, yeah, yeah. clock. It just you get such a sense of who this guy is. He's very um, he doesn't want trouble, you know. He just wants to live in his nice little apartment and listen to his records. And he does mention he's getting a divorce. I don't know why. Maybe he wasn't an asshole enough. <laughs> well, it sounds, and that's like part of his whole thing is he. He talks about getting this divorce, but he even says, like, no, like, she, she deserves better. I can't be the husband that, that she deserves. And oh, because of his job and everything? Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, at one point, Eric touches him, and just like with Gabriel the cat, he just in, in, ingests all of this pain that he saw because Albrecht was with uh, his fiance as she died and, yeah. and stayed with her the whole That's time. That's how he, he learns that Albrecht was with Shelly that yeah. whole time. And 30 hours of pain and suffering. Yeah. And he, like, then he Albrecht is such an, I, I love Albrecht. He's great. He's and, such, and, then, and Alex Perea said he cast Ernie Hudson because you, you look at him and you're like, oh, this person is like warm, you know? Yeah. And I wonder if too, that's the association, you know, from other movies that he'd been in and, up to Yeah, if you point. don't know just by name, Ernie Hudson from Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. Yeah. You instantly, there is almost like a childlike feeling of I trust this person that you associate with him and I feel like that um, I think Tony Todd was he read for Albrecht he did Tony Todd wanted to play that character mm -hmm. uh, but instead they gave him I Grange. don't even know his character's name what Grange I don't think Grange is a character in the graphic novel. Um, oh. I think he is a film invention. And what's interesting is he was cast, uh, Alex Perea said that he didn't even cast Tony Todd based on stuff he'd been in. Like he had seen Candyman, but he met Tony and was like, oh, this guy, you talk to him and he just feels very still. Like he's very even keel. And yeah. it's like a comforting, like still, like, I don't want to say like predictability, but like just a... You know what I mean? Stable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And like this uh, Grange character. And they do him up in, in these little ground I'm, glasses I'm and a turtleneck. He looks adorable. Yeah, he does. My yes. only complaint with this movie is there's not more Tony Todd. And he kind of, his death is a little, he might be dull machete. That is dull machete for sure. Yeah. He gets shot a couple of times and, and then you you're like, it. wait, that's it? He's gone? It's blink and you miss it for sure. It's a bummer, sure. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's later though. That's much later. Yes. Because <laughs> uh, right now he's still tracking down that foursome uh, of, oh yeah. The uh, Fired Up Gang. What's up? The Fired Up Gang. The Fired the Up Gang. Them. Yeah, Cottonmouth Kings. Fired <laughs> Up. <laughs> oh, uh, Gideon goes to uh, Top Dollar. Mm -hmm. Not, not, well, not um, Hit Rose Top Dollar. <laughs> uh, actual Top Dollar. Yeah. Yes. I mean, he's screaming about, like, there's a ghost and a ghost is going to come kill me. And this is when I think. Top no, that's Stank. Oh, that's doing that. Listen, it's you. You mix up all these weirdos. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's that's not Tintin or Fun Guy. It's uh, Fun Guy. <laughs> that's Stank. <laughs> Skanky Stank. Uh, no, the Gideon, the pawn shop owner. 
mm-hmm. goes to Top Dollar. And that's when we learn that Top Dollar is a sword guy. He's a blade guy. Yes, Top Dollar is a sword guy. Like, if you go to, if you went He's to his house, we got cabinet. katanas on the walls. You know, you know, in Halloween 2018, Lori Strode's gun cabinet? He's got that, but they're all blades. Yeah. Which I think is kind of cooler. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My, tra- my trainer's a, a blade guy, a sword guy. Yeah. Orion, yeah. He's a sword guy. Like, like katanas and stuff? All sorts or? of shit, dude. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I showed him that one that I used uh, to do the champagne trick from Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. They immediately identified it. I can't even remember the name anymore. I had a friend growing up uh, who was like a sword guy. Uh, and all the swords that he had, uh, he had them up on the wall in his basement, which was kind of like his, you know, little area. Like basically, I think, he, I think at that point, it was like you, like you moved into the basement of the house. Yeah. But it was a thing where he, we would go over and he'd have to be like, okay, when you sit down on the couch, don't sit down on it too hard because if you hit the wall, the swords will fall down. Above you on the couch? That was just the thing. If you go to Jordan's house, you can't sit on the couch and hit the wall or the swords will fall on you. Wow, my basement bedroom had a poster of Padme Amidala on the wall. That's way better than a sword that'll fall and kill you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I think in the Exorcist 2 kill count, there, I include a picture of me in that basement room, and I think you can see that Padme Amidala poster behind me. So <laughs> keep an eye out for that. That was a little scoop for you. And it's not a sword that'll kill you. Uh, but he does kill Gideon with a sword. But that... Not even that. He, he tries to kill Gideon with a sword, and then he takes too long to die, so then he asks Tony Todd for his gun, and then he shoots him. Oh, times. that's right, yeah. And it's fucking awesome. Yeah, and it's after. It's so funny, because Gideon is like, he's giving him all the information, and I forget why he kills him. I think he's just annoyed by he's him. He's just annoyed but by him. But I remember him. my mom was like, but he told him what he wanted to know. <laughs> I think this top dollar guy is not on the up and up. <laughs> Uh, so we still got a couple of fired up guys to kill. T-Bird is one of them. He drives yes, a T-Bird. I love this whole sequence. We get a little car chase in this. Done with miniatures. Done with tiny little cars. Yes, jolly little cars. If you, shot know, from above. if you know to look for it next time you watch it, you'll notice like when they are I, definitely I feel miniatures. like they were those cars that they're just at like matchbox you cars that they pull back, back and then it goes. I think that's bit. how they did this. Yeah. Yeah. Like all the shots where there's cars that are like sliding, those are all miniatures because literally the back lot they're shooting on, there wasn't enough room to Was get going like that fast. Yes. Yeah. So most of that sequence is all miniatures. I think it's done really, really well. And it's, it's cool too because I think the artifice is part of the charm. Like I don't think that they mind it at all that you could still kind of tell it's miniatures in the end product, but I think it adds to the kind of weird feeling of the whole thing. I love it. I do love during this chase, you get the cop who's like drinking coffee and he's like, I hate that they can't even legally call it cream anymore. <laughs> yeah. it's, just, it's just like a random one-off line. And then they see the cars drive by and he, the, his driver like yeah, starts up and he like spills on it. coffee dumped on Later, him. Later a body falls like on it's his hood. It's the same guy. Oh, come on. Yep. That guy's having a bad day at work for <laughs> sure. <laughs> but yeah, the fun little chase scene where um, what, uh, Eric's in the back seat of T-Bird's T-Bird. Yeah, and he's making him like drive faster and faster and faster. They get out to this pier. Mm-hmm. He ties up T-Bird in the car, puts like dynamite between his legs and just... Uh, <laughs> Put, launches that thing launches off of this car dude. and this is a it's a uh the body of a car with all the stuff taken out on top of a chassis they sent and it was supposed to apparently fly way farther than it did well you see like the bottom part of the car come out it's <laughs> that was the apart. one shot they had and they're all on this like oh shit like it's, <laughs> it's it, like it happened way earlier than i thought but luckily they caught it and it ended up looking super cool but also, what looks super cool is after he kills him, he just, like, flicks a lighter on the ground, and I don't know when he had the time to do this, but he, like, poured gas Fuck on yeah. the ground in the shape, an elaborate shape of a crow. Fuck yeah. It's got, like, yeah. t- daggered it's got wings. It's feathers and a big yeah. little beak. It's so cool. And They're, like, talons and yeah. shit. It's cool. This is, I think this is what I love so much about this movie, and I think what makes this movie very cool and what I think modern movies could stand to learn from something like this or stand to um, maybe like harken back to is I think if you know a character doing something like this your first thought is like when did he have the time why he's you know we've got more people to kill he's got yeah yeah (laughs) right exactly but 
That's what makes it so fun. It's like, who fucking cares? Yeah, it looks, it looks cool. cool. That's why. It looks cool. Therefore, <laughs> rule of cool. For sure. Apparently, so, this is practical. They did this for real. Awesome. They um, dug a, like, an inch deep, like, kind of, uh, like a, like a, tre- R- ribbit? Yeah, ribbit. like, they made, like, a groove in the ground in the groove. shape of that, cr- and filled it with, ga- and they had, they tr- did it once, and they were like, damn, that, okay. Wow, that looked cool as fuck. <laughs> 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 they were like, we're moving on. <laughs> right. Cut, print, All moving right. on. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Stank is the last one, and he's all freaking out because everyone around him is dying, so he goes to talk to Top Dollar, who looks like a pirate for some reason. He's dressed like a little pirate. He, yes, he's got the full, like, he's, he's, wear, he's basically wearing the pirate shirt from Seinfeld with, like, a little vest on top. I'm not a pirate. I love it. Again, rule of cool be for pirate. sure. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, like Top Dollar is having like a meeting where all of their all oh of my the God, all guns the, this and whole... drugs and cash on a table. I don't know how what the organization says. It's like a this Last is. Supper table. Dude, we get confused when we're trying to like cash out at the end of the day of a, a convention, and that's just like I just a add one... guns and coke into yes. the mix. And <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. Um, I love all the random guys we see in this. Just for this scene, and I, all their weird little outfits, and this is the scene specifically the director said, I wanted it to feel like both a Western and a John Woo movie. Oh, okay, And yeah. this is more rule of cool stuff, where once you get into the actual shootout, there's just debris and like pieces of paper flying everywhere, which weren't, those didn't exist in that <laughs> overhead shot at all. But he even says in the commentary, like, it looks cool, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're, like, having a little meeting about how, like, Devil's Night needs to be more devil Yes, this is so... Michael Wincott uh, rants about the commercialization of Devil's Night. He's yeah. sick of it turning into a little cute Detroit holiday with greeting cards, and no. He says he wants to set the city on fire. He wants to light it on fire so big that God notices us again. Fuck, that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> And that's when Eric shows up and says, gentlemen. Gentlemen. And then hops on the table cross-legged like he's about to drop a pipe bomb, dude. Yeah. He is, <laughs> he, is, uh, he is just, he's like, just give me the stank. I just want to kill that stank guy just right there. kill this one guy. You guys, don't, I, even know, you guys don't even know that guy. Yeah. I just want to kill him. I'm out of your hair after I get this dude. I'm done, right? But no, it's got to turn into a whole shootout, of course. And, you know, this shootout is probably my least favorite part of the movie. It goes Wait, are you serious? It's awesome. It's just, they're just shooting guns. Oh, but it looks shoot. so cool. It's, it's okay. I'm just like, after a while, I'm like, I get, they're all dead. Just, just all right, let's get to the next guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think, right. I wonder if it's a symptom of, this was so hard to shoot, we have to include it all. <laughs> yeah. Because that sometimes happens. If any of you have shot a film, it doesn't matter what budget, uh, if something was like hard to do, you feel compelled to put it in, even if you don't need it. You know, I, I mean, it's also, you know, I'm it. sure plenty of people thought it was cool. If you I thought mean, the I shootout think... was cool, let me hear you. Yeah, so fuck me. I'm the weird one. It's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You suck, James. <laughs> um, the cops show up. Top Dollar survives. This him and Biling run. And they, Tony they Top, they get out away. Out the back. Yeah. Yep. And and Stank is the last one he kills by throwing him out the window. Yep. Which is what he did to him. Yes. Uh, and and T Bird was the getaway driver, I assume. So that's mm-hmm. why he killed him with the the car. Mm-hmm. That's the whole thing. Fun guy was a uh, fun dude. <laughs> fun fun boy. He's a boy. Uh, I think fun he... guy's like the spirit Halloween costume of him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Fun dude uh, injected his fiance with drugs, so that's why he killed him right. via drugs. Just injected him with a bunch of drugs. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he's, it's thematic, you know. It's great like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's always fun. Then the but, cops show up, and then Eric Draven does a cute little dance away from the cops. I oh yeah, it. he's like da 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 da. Apparently just improvised. I oh. think he was so like exhausted and just wa- he was tired of like every scene. He just slinks away and he was, just did this little It's like dance. in the background of a shot. They don't do a <laughs> close up and we were just like, wait, what the fuck? That yeah. was hilarious. They were like, that's cool. We'll, we'll just leave it. So here's the thing. At this point, Eric's done. He's gotten his revenge. Yeah. There's, there's no he's, scene where he's like, oh, these four were working wait a for minute. top dollar. It goes deeper. No. Oh my God. This he's, is like- That guy is ready to go back to bed in his grave. He like goes back to the tombstones as like, well, I, 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 I avenged you. I'm and ready you know to go who to sleep. fucks up? Honestly, is Tony Todd. Tony, Tony Todd Todd's got to kid. kidnap that kid. Well, he's just following orders because, because <laughs> Bai Ling wants that bird. She's like, oh, that bird can see shit. 
I want its eyes. I want it. So yep. to get the bird, they kidnap the kid. Yeah. And but the bird also, sees it. And that she also wants the little kid's eyes. She wants everybody's eyes. She eyeballs. wants all the eyes. On everyone's eyeballs, yeah. So they kidnap the kid, but the bird sees it. So so Eric sees it. Yeah. It's like, ah, f- ah, I was just about to. I was going to uh, go. I was, I'm done. I'm going to I'll bed. I'll go save this kid. Gotta okay. save this kid. Yeah. You already, you already got her mom back. Isn't that Darla's job now? <laughs> No, but that's the, that's why Eric is so great. And this, he is. this is some story stuff I think was removed from the movie, actually, is him helping. Uh, so his mission, and this is why the crow brings him back, is his mission is to kill these these guys, right? Yeah. That is what he's meant to do, and that is why he has these powers of immortality. Whenever he decides to meddle in the affairs of the living by doing stuff like helping Darla or Sarah, it weakens him. Oh. This is This was not stuff that made the final cut. Um, they kind of edited around this. Okay. But that is part of, and so that is also why, you know, it, it's an additional sacrifice on his part. They did rework it so that um, injuring- The bird gets shot. Yes, and, and, so it's and the that's bird is what hurt. makes him mortal. Okay. But originally it was, I'm helping these he, these humans in like these mortal affairs. He's doing affairs. a side quest. He's doing side yeah. quests. And he, that is what is then making him mortal, is this like choice to help others. And oh, that's great. Yeah. I love that. I love this character. Yeah. I know. Uh, I, I love this character a lot, yeah. Yeah, but so he goes to save the kid. Uh, Ernie Hudson shows up, too. That's when he shoots Tony oh, Todd. Yeah. And they're in this, this gothic cathedral mm-hmm. that definitely exists in <laughs> yeah. Detroit. What's interesting is this cathedral, um, I didn't notice, is completely a soundstage. And not even just like, oh, they built a cathedral. It doesn't have walls. If you if you notice the the interior of it is like a black box. It is a complete illusion. There are pews and it is completely dark and there's lights and there's that's it. It is. Oh wow! Yeah, I never even noticed that. It's so cool. Yeah, oh, it's all just fake. He says the director said that any walls you see on it are from the exterior and that's the miniature they built. Oh, it's okay. so neat. Oh, yeah. Way to work on a budget. What was the budget for this? Do you have that offhand? I don't have it offhand, okay. no. Yeah, um, but... What's so funny is the same technique is used for the third act of Killer Clowns from Outer Space. <laughs> well, in the clown ship? Yes, the clown ship. Well, there is the... I notice it. There you can, there, there's like the tape on the floor of the studio. <laughs> you notice it. But it's the same idea of like, we're going to work in this giant black box and use lights to kind of fake this being a, an actual space. Uh, Wikipedia said the budget is $23 million. So not... Oh, Oh, but I think eight of that was from the reshoots they did after the accident. And like tons of effects. Yeah, because they had to like use computers to put his face on And this on is, a, I mean, mid, this is early 94. 90s. Yeah. It's complete, but it worked. It does work, yeah. But yeah, so a lot, a lot of that budget was not Apparently in the Apparently at first they tried working with um, doubles who did have like masks that looked like him and they said it was just so ghoulish. They were like, They didn't nah, like it, nah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I'm nope. sure no one, yeah, wanted to do that. No one wanted to do that. Uh, yeah, Tony Todd gets killed. It's a, it's a bummer. Just like shot a couple of times. It's, it truly, it's blink and you miss it. Yeah, yeah. because yeah, because uh, Ernie asks Eric how many are there, and Eric's like, well, two left. And you were like, wait, what? I, yeah, I was looking down, taking notes. I'm like, oh my god, Tony's dead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Bai Ling stole the bird, but like the bird ain't having it. Nope. That bird pecks her eyes out. Yes, it itself. does. Yeah. Revenge. And she falls to her death. Everyone's fallen to their Everyone's death. Everyone's fallen off stuff in like, this. Literally, yeah. I mean, even I mean, Top, top dollar. dollar falls. and um, After uh, a rooftop fight. Yeah, it looks like the end of Beauty and the Beast. That's exactly fight. what it, it is. It is like Beast and Gaston fighting on the castle. Mm-hmm. Down to the girl, like, on the side. Like, no! <laughs> <laughs> and there's gargoyles, and it's awesome. Top Dollar falls and gets impaled on a gargoyle. It's extremely cool. Like, his, it's something through his head, and then his blood is coming, coming out the gargoyle's out mouth. Ma- it's fucking metal. It's um, cool. I'm not sure if it's still for sale, but I was looking, because I love looking at movie props online. Um, I think for about is it like $7,000, you can um, buy Michael Wincott's fake head <laughs> with, the, with the, um, the, the spire coming out of it. Um, I, I think it might literally still be for sale or in a current auction. 
Oh, um, and, and just to shade in that fight a little bit, because it's cool. Uh, one of them rips off the lightning rod of the building, so it's like lightning rod Eric versus does, sword. Yeah, and yeah. It, it's funny because it looks like a very fancy uh, like cutlass or something. But. And then he eventually, you know, Eric gets stabbed, but the way that he defeats uh, Michael Wincott is by grabbing him and transferring those thirty hours of pain and suffering That's right. All from of his fiance's death. The like flashbacks that he's been receiving through the film, he then is able to like put that back into Michael Wincott's brain. So he's like reaping everything he sowed and then that causes him to fall. To like, yeah, his brain just breaks. And And it's like, dude, if you would just let him go back to his little grave, you'd be good. If you didn't want to do weird bird magic. You could be making out with your half sister. There you go. You know? And admiring your collection of sword, pondering your sword collection. (laughs) Yeah. But instead you just had to go steal a kid, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Uh, so Eric, now that he's all stabbed and, uh, you know, he's done, he's done his stuff. He goes back to the grave and collapses. And that's when his fiance ghost shows up and gives him a little kiss. It's very, um, which Halloween, the, the Rob Zombie Halloween with, uh, oh, uh Sherry two, Zombie yeah, showing with in the, the white, white horse. <laughs> yes. The best like part it. of that whole franchise. It is, it is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then, uh, it, it, it ends and you get the quote, buildings burn, people die. And uh, a little friend named Spencer Charnas used that in some of his music, that exact line. Oh, and, do they use it in the, the Crow song? Uh, I think in that song, or even, even earlier than that, maybe in the, uh, uh, even before they were doing the, the horror shtick. Mm-hmm. I think he just used that because he's a big fan of uh, horror. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that's the movie. It's the Crow. That's the Crow. Yeah. I... I, I really, I, I don't know if it was just the kind of additional, like, pressure of, like, I really got to know this movie because it's like, I got I got to know it for a live show. Yeah. I feel very, like... People paid us for this. <laughs> right. We don't, don't want to let you guys down. Like, I feel so well acquainted with this movie, but I, I, I really do love it. Dude, that happens to me all the time with Kill Counts, with all the research I do. I'm like, unless it's Hannibal Rising, but it's all, <laughs> I see so much of what goes into it. I'm like, man... They made that shit happen. It's yeah. good. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is normally when we plug our social... <laughs> just, you know what I mean? <laughs> this is very different in a live format. Um, I mean, I don't know. I almost want to read this quote from, from Brandon Lee from the, the behind-the-scenes documentary because I do think it's really beautiful. Uh, well, yeah, we, we should end on that, but I, I do think uh, we should thank some people, um, our, our family who came here to see us, uh, Where are they sitting? Yeah. My, my sister Janelle and, and Michael and your, your family. Yes, my mom, dad, my sister. Thank you so much for coming. Rachel and Claudia Thank and Bob. Thank you all for Thank coming. You. Um, uh, all of you, of course, for coming. Uh, yes. Really appreciate that. This is, we're, we're on the end of a, a pr- kind of long trip. A 10 day trip. 10 day trip where we're doing conventions and visiting family. And this has been kind of like hanging over the, the whole trip, you know, it was like, we got to do, this is this big live show at the end of Yeah, it. this is the last thing, because, like, we, we did Spookala in Tampa. Uh, that was a three-day convention where we met a ton of people. It was great. But then we stayed with my mom, and it, it was great to see her, but uh, we were meeting new people, so it was more of, like, still on, kind of, and sleeping on a, a fold-out uh, thin mattress pad for a few nights. And then we flew from Tampa up here to Detroit, uh, slept for 12 hours that first night That's in the hotel. Very nice. But then did three more days of another convention. Astronomica. How, Astro- how many of you did we meet at Astronomicon? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you so much if you came there. Yeah, thank really you Really appreciate much. that. But that was three more days of convention. It was very nice to, to, to meet people who said they were coming to the show. And it was cool sitting back there thinking like, no, you know what? I've already met a lot of the people are going to be out there. It reassured us that this would like, go yeah, well. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then it was like all leading to this. So yeah. we really appreciate this. And uh, thank you, Macy and Chloe, who are with the organization that, that helped put this on. Yes. And um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you to the crew at the Masonic Temple. Yeah. For, oh my God. Uh, Scotty on, on lights and Zach on sound and Ray videographing it. Thank you so much for doing all the technical stuff. Yeah. They're why we're going to be able to put this out as a podcast episode on the new channel, Dead Me Presents. Make sure you subscribe for all. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's, it's these kind of people who are going to like Dead Me Presents and I fucking love them for yes. it. Yeah. Thank you Love for you being such a receptive and, and loud and wonderful audience. Uh, we really truly. appreciate yes, it. Yes, this was... Uh, yeah. 
This was absolutely fucking terrifying, and I, uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank oh, you. Thank you. <laughs> so, It's a little different from being in like a, a bedroom in our house. I know, no Molly on our laps. Yeah, oh yeah. No, we're gonna get to see Molly tomorrow and Lucy. We get to see the pets tomorrow! Can't all wait right. for that. All right, I'm gonna leave you all with this quote. This is from the, the behind the scenes, uh, if, if you have the Blu-ray of the quote, you can, you can go watch this clip from the behind the scenes documentary. They interviewed Brandon Lee while he was mid-filming and I thought- So this was uh, how, it was like a week before the this accident, This was like, right? a, I think, a week before he passed away. And this quote, in retrospect, is incredibly eerie, but it's also very beautiful. And I think, like, extremely, you know, it's, it, it's worth, you know, thinking about. And I think it's incredibly um, beautiful. So uh, he's kind of paraphrasing a, a novel here that he had read, uh, a 1949 novel, The Sheltering Sky by Paul Bowles. But he says, Because we do not know when we will die, we get to think of life as an inexhaustible well. And yet everything happens only a certain number of times, and a very small number, really. How many more times will you remember a certain afternoon of your childhood, an afternoon that is so deeply a part of your being that you can't even conceive of your life without it? Perhaps four or five times more? Perhaps not even that. How many more times will you watch the full moon rise? Perhaps 20. And yet it all seems limitless. I know that's kind of a roundabout way of talking about it, but you tend to take a great deal for granted perhaps because you feel like you're going to live forever. It's only if you lose a friend or maybe have a near-death experience that many events and people in your life suddenly attain real significance. When you take into account the fact that that could have been the last time I would ever see that person or do something so mundane as to go out to dinner, this is where this character is coming from. He realizes how precious each moment of his life is. Thank you all so much. 